Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to um, first uh, give a few acknowledgments before I get started. Uh, you know, I, I did. We did have a brief conversation with your, your president, and uh, it's amazing to have a, a, someone that actually has a vision and a passion to make sure that the people that are that he's leading are going to the next level. So um, I'm looking to see a lot of special things with uh, El Centro, this school, and then and just what he's bringing to the table. I, I, I'm living in Chicago right now. Uh, originally, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And, uh, and, and, and right now in Chicago, you know, there's a 50% rate of graduation. Uh, I lecture to a lot of the schools and um, in the CPS and in the suburbs. And, and one of the things that I, I see is what I talk about a lot with help, being, being a doctor first, is stress. And the, the stress rate is so high that I barely see a teacher come in and talk about genuine concern for their, their students actually excelling. It's more so pushing them through the system. I know the children that are 15 and 16 years old that cannot read, or they're reading at a, a seventh grade level, and that is the average of what is being graduated. So to see the passion that uh, the president has for education is, uh, is absolutely amazing. And I, I can't leave out uh, Will, Will Smith, um, just an amazing guy trying to really do things to see the school move forward, to see young Latinos, young black, African-American males and women move forward in education so you all can see that vision for yourselves. Because you'd be surprised that as soon as the vision is clear, everything else falls into place. So that's enough about that. I want to just give them a hand. And to really get started, now, I am a first generation college student. Um, my, I have a brother and a sister, and they, they went shortly after myself. Um, I'm from a single parent home, so my mother was the one that was at home with us. Um, from the age of five, my, my mother was uh, stricken with a condition known as multiple sclerosis. And if you know anything about multiple sclerosis, it's a neurological disorder that begins to, to break the body down in, in a lot of different uh, ways. So growing up like that, it was, uh, it was, it was quite a challenge at, uh, in many different uh, facets in, in having success. But what I did learn was that every single thing that happened to me happened for me. And that was, that was one of the most amazing things. So right now, if you are a, a first generation college student, what you are is you're the diamond in the rug. Right now, your life, I mean, your life is, 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 is a multitude of things that you can have and you can do because right now you're a wedge puzzle. Okay. I, I often reference to sports because I played sports a little while and, and oftentimes uh, I look at the, uh, the guy that would come down the field and the first guy that would actually make the hit in a, in a, in a football would, would bust the wedge. They would break things open and that's when every single thing happened. So that's what you're doing right now for your future, your, your, your future generations and even the people that you associate yourself with. So, so that's exciting. That, that's really exciting. Now, I like to um, get kind of started off too, a little bit about what I do. I, I'm a chiropractor, all right? Now, you'll find that when you're chasing your passion, that when you're chasing your dream, when you're chasing something, your life begins to evolve and all of these different things are gonna to start to happen as far as what you're gonna do. Initially, I thought, you know what, I'm gonna be an NFL player. I, I hear that so many times in the school when I go talk to the kids. I said, what do you want to be? An NFL player. I said, what's your backup plan? That's the first thing I asked. When I went to college, I was a preseason All-American. I had a couple of teams come and look at me, uh, the Broncos and, uh, and the Colts. And, and one of the first things that they told me, they said, we want you to put on 20 pounds in a home. I said, OK. So that's a lot of meat and potatoes, right? But that, that's not what they were talking about. They were actually talking about something a little bit more. And anything that goes against your morals and your ethics and your daily habits, you don't want to do. And one thing that I found is that all of this goes away. But this right here stays with you forever. And no one can take it away from you. So you want to harness it 
You want to grow it, you want to pour into it, and you want to take care of it because this is what you can carry with you and constantly take with you for the rest of your life. So I'm going to ask everybody a question. How many of us in here, by raising hands, have ran a race, by raising hands, with over a million people in it and one? With over a million people in it and one? Wow, that's one person? Outstanding. Well, if you all think that you haven't, I think that you're lying because right now, every single one of you all started from 8 million sperm cells. And there was one egg. And you know what? You made it. Okay? So you're a natural born winner if you didn't know that. You already won. Now, every single thing that happened, your, your, your heart knew the proper size to be in your chest. Your fingers knew the proper size. Your eyes, everything that happened was perfection at that time. It's everything that happened afterwards is the journey, right? There's a story about the marathon runner, and um, I, I, you all might have seen a movie called 300, right? And this guy ran back to marathon, right? And he gave the message. But the real story behind that was, was when the guy actually gave the message, he died. And in our lives, our lives are like a marathon, all right? It's not a sprint. The thing about it is we have to enjoy the ride. And when you finally reach the destination, your, your life's purpose, that's when it's going to go. That's when it's going to end. And when you, when you, when you make your, your cross across that line in the marathon, this is when life truly is going to be purposeful for you. So this is, this, is the, this is the points that we're talking about. So when I go over here, these are the things in my life, through my struggles and through the things that I do, that have actually got me to the point where I'm at. So I started off thinking I was going to play football, and then, I, and then I, as I began to get older and I, I went to college, one of the first things that they saw, they saw that I was a, a big African-American male. So they said, you know what? You should be a gym teacher. I said, um, well, I, I kind of want to do something a little more technical. Well, no, we have a great gym teacher. You know, you can go to swimming and, 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 and basket weaving and, and you can take this class and that course and it'll be great for you. I said, you know, there's only three things that I, I choose to be. I want to be either an engineer, a doctor, or a lawyer. I didn't like the books, so law was out. I didn't like too much math, so I didn't want to go into, um, into engineering. So science was a true passion of mine, and I, so I decided to go into medicine. So in my path on going through medicine and, and becoming a, a chiropractic physician, one of the things I saw was the disparity. Right now in our country, they say, what, half of us are going to have a heart attack, right? Then a third of us are going to have cancer. So I began to start thinking of how I could impact the world and how I could change it now on a global aspect. So before it was about me, then it began to be about my community, now it's about changing the country. So this is how critical thinking has begun to develop in my life and how it's got me to the point where I could continue to move forward and press on. And some of the things that I actually put together just in my life, and some of these things that you're gonna be able to utilize, I hope that you utilize, if you could take one of these things today, what I want you to do is have an addiction, a healthy addiction, an addiction to winning. When you have a healthy addiction to winning, one of the things that actually, the concept of, of it is, you don't lay down. I didn't have straight A's. I wasn't the strongest. I didn't have the best study skills. And I didn't have all of the resources. But what I did was I had a system to how I performed, and I did things and these things can be successful and replicated and duplicated within your lives in order to help you support you have success. The first thing is purpose, as far as really understanding and defining and having a purpose. And within your purpose, what, what, um, one thing that I love that Aristotle said is 95% of every single thing that you do is a result of habit. So when we win, it's a result of habit. When we, when, we, when we study, it's a result of habit. When we push, it's a result of habit. And these are things that you start right now replicating and putting into your life. So as we go on, one of the biggest things as far as starting off with building these habits and having purpose is understanding your why. Your why should wake you up every single morning with your heart beating out your chest. Your why should wake you up every single morning, never being late. Your why should wake you up and push you toward every single thing that you want to do. Every, every one of us has a why. 
This is an amazing book right here. If you um, never heard of Simon and Sinek, powerful, powerful, powerful book about how to discover your why and how to use it. See, there's the why, the who, the what, the how. All of those things, they, they come in fruition as soon as you understand your why. Your why is the most important thing. And then there's two different kind of people in this world. There's two different kind of people. There's the people that can accomplish things. There's the people that can make anything happen. Those are the people that got the straight A's. Right? That effortlessly, they can go run a race and do it. No problem. But then you got the other person that has the vision. You need both of them together. The person with the strongest why is the person that's going to have the vision that's going to carry and move people in a way that's going to help support people to have success. I look at Rockefeller and um, any, anybody ever heard of Rockefeller? Multi-millionaire back in a thousand years ago, right? Unheard of, right? Do you know he could barely read? What he was known for was organizing a team of people around him and putting people in places where things actually happen. And you can do these same things in your life by the relationship that you have. This is my why up here. This is myself and my mother at uh, my graduation. That was the last time she was able to actually come out of the house. And it was an exciting moment for me that she could be there at my graduation for her to see me walk across the stage. It, it, was, it, was, it was amazing and to know that I was going to college and I would be the very first, the very first person to go to college. That right there is my family. My, my sons, my daughter, my mother-in-law, and my father-in-law. I know that today, in this country, we have all kind of decreasing rates of graduations, we have higher states of, of sickness and disease, and it's due to lack of education. If I don't do something about it now, I have three children that are going to go into this world and not have a chance, or not a stronger chance. See, when you know better, you should what? You all know that? What a concept. See, when you know better, you should actually do better. And that doesn't just mean for yourself, but that means for everything around you. One of these days, what we're going to have to do is not only just our family members and friends, but it's the people in our community, our brothers and sisters. These are the people that we got to lift up because these are the people that are going to lift us up. So being on purpose. Being on purpose is starting the day off every single day with a clear, precise, vision of what your why is and really understanding how you're going to persuade it. How you're going to go into your classrooms, how you're going to start your day. And something that's going to be big too is not only just being in the books, but it's going to be taking care of yourself. Because oftentimes we'll let ourselves go to the wayside and put everything before us, but we, if we can't take care of ourselves, we can't do for everything in our environment. And that's a big thing with responsibility. And I'm not talking about being responsible picking up the laundry, right? Making sure that you do the dishes, right? Responsibility is how you respond in any situation. Oh, you know what? Today we're going to have a, a, a picnic, but it rains. How are you going to respond? You walk into the classroom, today we have a pop quiz. How are you going to respond? One of the things that I did when I uh, first went to college, because I didn't know anything about college, I, uh, I showed up and I had all of my clothes. And you think that's all you need, your clothes. Well, I walked into a room and I didn't have sheets, pillows. I didn't have cleaning products to clean the room because I figured I'd have a brand new apartment suite, right? Because it's college. Well, I, it didn't have air conditioning and the windows were up and there were locusts in my room and... It, it was uh, definitely an amazing experience, to say the least. But I took that, and it gave me an opportunity to learn. I began to walk down the hallways and ask people about, you know, what are you doing? How are you doing this? And sooner or later, I had a community of people where we were sharing and we were organizing the other first-time college students, and we were able to support each other and give everything that everyone needs. 
And understanding too, when you're on purpose, is you can't not get where you're already at. Does that make sense? You can't not get where you're already at. How many people in here already know the career that they want to do? By raising hands. They already know the, the salary that they want to have. How many family members that they want to have? These are the things that you want to put into your mind because once you have that there, it's already there, and then you're just working backwards. So everything is working backwards right now. So you're already winning. The minute that the vision is clear is the minute that everything begins to come together. And the clearer the vision, the easier the path. Have you ever gotten to your car and start driving, but you didn't have no place to go? You didn't know where you were going. Oh, some people are, yeah, they have, huh? You ever got into your car and had no destination and just start driving it and was hoping to, to end up somewhere? Just, just driving, drive with the gas prices the way that they are. You just got in your car and just start driving. No, but when you have a destination in mind, when you have a destination, you can drive and there could be traffic. And what can you do? You can get off and do what? Take a side road. You can be stopped, you can get into an accident, but you can pick back up and keep on moving and arrive at your destination. Because you know where you're going. And when it's so clear, you can see it, you can taste it, you can feel it. And then all of a sudden, people, be, you begin to talk about it, right? Yeah, I'm gonna be doing this, I'm gonna be going here, I'm gonna be, and all of a sudden, people start helping you. You start picking up things on the way. These are the type of things, critically, when we're thinking, you know, how am I going to make this happen? Having the end in mind. Now, I think about Vince Lombardi, and if you, you know anything about Vince Lombardi, uh, I, I'll never forget one of the quotes that he, that he said, you know, it was a game that they lost, and it was in the playoffs, and, and, and it, was, it was a grueling game. And they were pushing and pushing and pushing, and, and they lost just by a few points. And when the, when the, when the sports announcer came up to him, they... They said to him, you know, well, what happened in the game, you know, that you lost? And he stopped them right there and he said, we didn't lose the game. We ran out of time. We didn't lose the game, but we ran out of time. The mentality of the, the, the fight is the obsession of winning. I don't know if you all have ever heard of a boxer. His name is uh, Floyd, Floyd Mayweather. Floyd Mayweather? Is it Mayweather? Absolutely. Now, you know, he got on TV the other day, and he said, <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm better than Muhammad Ali and Sugar Ray Leonard. He said, I'm better than them. Now, people look at him like he's crazy, right? They look at him like he's crazy. But they looked at Martin Luther King like he was crazy, too, when he talked about equality. And being able to walk down the sidewalk with someone holding their hands of a different gender and race. They, they, they looked at Gandhi like he was crazy when he talked about peace. They looked at Mother Teresa like she was crazy when, when an orphanage burned down and she said that I will find every single child a home here. It's the crazy people, the crazy people with the vision of something bigger that make the things happen. So we look at that right here when we talk about being on purpose, one of the things that we can adapt. Now, if you don't get anything, these are what, some of the things right here that are extremely powerful. Number one, rituals. Rituals are things that we do on a consistent basis every single day. It doesn't change no matter what. You all know your rituals. And some of these things that we need to incorporate into our lives. These rituals will keep you organized, they will keep you on task, and they will definitely keep you on purpose. With rituals, it can be something basic like a list of things that you do when you wake up in the morning. When, when I wake up in the morning, sometimes I forget my keys. Oh, I didn't check this email. Oh, I got a homework assignment I got to do. Man, oh, they left me a message. You might want to put on your ritual list in the morning, that night before you go to bed, I gotta hang my key up here every single day. I need to check my emails every single morning and dedicate at least five minutes of time to it. I need to check my messages and dedicate at least two minutes of time to it. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, I need to open up a LinkedIn account and dedicate five minutes of time to it every day and talk to professionals. 
Talk to people in your field. Share yourselves with them. Let them know your struggles and what you're doing and most importantly, where you're going. Because you're already there. You're just letting everybody else know that it's just a matter of time. The next thing is meditation and prayer. There is a difference between the two, right? Does meditation mean that you're on the top of a mountain and you have the loincloth on and you're sitting there in the freezing weather for 60 minutes trying to get a, a moment? Is that what meditation is? Come on, y'all. Is that what it is? No. Meditation is sitting, relaxing, and it's listening. Prayer is asking. Meditation is listening. Try losing something one day or forgetting something one day and sit still and watch the answers come to you. Watch the peace come over you. And, and sometimes the noise in your head, you know your voices that you hear in your head? All of those voices, some of you have more than others, all the voices that you hear in the head, right? All of the voices, those aren't your voices. Those are thoughts. The only voice that you have is the one that comes out of your mouth and it's the one that speaks life. Affirmations. How many of us do affirmations every morning? Wow. Words are powerful. Have you all ever heard of Dr. Emoto? Dr. Emoto did a study and what he did was he took two cups of water, right? And he played this music and he played positive music and he played positive music and he crystallized the water and there were beautiful crystals. He put words like happy. He put words like love. I care about you. Thank you. Then he crystallized them and all of them were different, beautiful crystals. I'm talking about some of the most beautiful formations that you've ever seen. No artist could re replicate these things. Then he took those same cups of water and he wrote kill and hate and, and, and bad words, right? All of these things on these cups. And what he did was when he crystallized them, there was, some of, it, there was mold growing on some of them. Microscopically, you could actually see the, the, the cells begin to break down. Your words are powerful. Your words are powerful. The things that you say about yourself, the things that you say about your day, the things that you say about your plan, you might not even believe them. Say them. Speak them. I'm wonderful. Say it with me. I'm wonderful. Do you believe that? It don't sound like it. I'm wonderful. I'm intelligent. I'm hardworking. I am the future. Do you feel better? You should. It's the truth. It's the truth. And you say those same words to other people. We all have a to-do list when we wake up in the morning and sometimes we can look at that to-do list and even throughout the day, start making a not to-do list. There's this thing called a not to do list. Stephen Covey actually talks about it. And what he says is the things that are actually the most urgent are the things that we need to do, right? If you have an oil light on your car and your oil light is running, right? But you have a nail in your tire and your nail is leaking air and you're driving and your tire is flat, which one is more urgent? Absolutely right. But see, the thing about how we're wired, some of us try to fix the, both of them at the same time. This is how we decrease stress and how we manage our lives. And even in our own lives, we got to find the things that are most urgent that we repair. Self-discipline is the ability to make yourself do what you should do when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. That's what self-discipline is. It's just doing exactly what you're supposed to do, whether you feel like it or not. All of us know what we need to do. We need to come to class. Right now, this is your job. We come to class, we study, and we're productive. Every single day, every single day, am I going to class? Am I studying? What did I do to be productive? These is how these things work. When I first went into to, 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 to college, one of the things that I, um, I, with my great education from the Detroit Public Schools, I, I realized that there was something that a lot of people were ahead that I was behind on. Certain concepts, 
certain studying patterns, certain habits. What I did was I made sure I showed up to every single class. And then when I really didn't understand something, I would go and talk to the teacher. They knew I was trying. They knew I was trying. They knew my effort was in there, and they knew I had a push and a drive. And it was because of a habitual habit of pushing and being on a schedule every single day. This is my ritual list. Every single morning of things that I do as soon as I get up. It takes me about 30 minutes. I get up first. Headspace is the very first thing. That's clear in my head, like no matter what the situation is, no matter how I'm feeling, no matter what's going on, it's raining, uh, uh, I need to, whatever it is, I get a clear headspace that it's gonna be an amazing day. The next thing I do is I'll, I'll say a prayer. I check my emails, I check my phone messages, I say my affirmations. I have a gratitude journal. All I do is write on a piece of paper, I'm thankful for life, I'm thankful for my family, I'm thankful for good health. I'm thankful for my businesses. I'm thankful for the people in my lives. All I have to write is one thing a day. I visualize how my day is going to go. I see myself driving to work. I see myself going into my office. I see myself seeing my patients. Once I have a visualization of what it's going to be, anything that comes up, I can deviate and get right back to my goal. I look at the, the, my core values, my mission and vision and purpose of the practice. I review my goals, my schedule, I work out. I read a book, any book, just for five minutes. Any book, whether it's a, half, a chapter, whether it's a page, I read for five minutes. Principles, proper principles. One of the things that I'm big on, being, being a physician is something that's that's so big because one of the things that I do is I, I talk about health constantly because I constantly see people in a state of burnout. And they're in a state of burnout is because we're all over the place. First starting with purpose, but you gotta have principles leading and directing the path in your life. The principles that you set up for yourself, right now we already have principles, right? We're already doing some of the things that we, we, we already know. We already have principles that we're following. And these are things that I found to be not only my patients more successful, but even some of the, the, the docs that I coach and I train to have some great results. And number one, making agreements with people. Wouldn't it be amazing to live in a world where everybody did what they say they were gonna do? I'm gonna come pick you up in 15 minutes at the train station. I'm going to make sure I get that email out to you by 12 o'clock. I'm going to pay the bill because I know the lights will be turned off if, if I don't pay it. The lights get turned off. You're standing in the rain. You never received the email. Being a person of your word speaks more than anything. So when you sit and you talk with people and you're having conversations with people, let them know that it's an agreement. And an agreement is not with yourself. The definition of agreement is a written contract. But when you make an agreement with someone, that you follow up on that. And that if you have to dissipate from that agreement, that you always verbally, you verbally go and you talk. And you say, you know, this is what happened. I want to I wanna definitely apologize about this and I want to make another agreement with you. In relationships in life, this can save you in so many instances. Following up with the things that you say. When you become a person of your word, all of a sudden you can speak things into existence. When, what, that, that doesn't make sense. When you become a person of your word, you can speak things into existence. Because every single thing that you say, every single word that you have, all of the sudden things begin to happen. And that's a powerful, powerful tool to have in any aspect of your life. The next thing is the power nap. Of course, I'm a physician first, so I always throw in a power nap. How long is a power nap? 20 minutes, okay? Not two hours. 
Throughout your day, you have to get rest. You have to detox, especially as a student. What NASA, these are rocket scientists, what they actually say is a 20 minute power nap is enough to get 40% of your cognitive function back. 40% of your cognitive function back. So you're talking about a two hour nap will destroy the whole serotonin levels of your entire body for the rest of the day. So be careful how you're resting. This is known to, number one, slow your heart down enough to build your immunity, cause overall relaxation, and it lowers your blood pressure. So when we're pushing and when we're out there on purpose and we're being aggressive, we got to give our bodies time to rest. And laughter. How important is laughter? I'm talking about laughing with people, not laughing at them. You have to laugh. There's, there's two studies here, and I, I don't know if you all have ever heard of uh, Gurma Belichu. He's actually a part of the World Laughter uh, Masters. And what he was known to have done is he healed himself from HIV from laughing. He healed himself from HIV from laughing. What he does now is he goes around and he lectures nationally. Lectures nationally. He had five children and his wife had AIDS. And he was worried about his children having the condition. Laughing literally can actually put you in a position to where it can relax the body and build up immunity. So you know what that means? That means that you gotta get rid of, you gotta get rid of toxic relationships. You know those people that you talk to that you know that you're gonna be upset, right? So, so when you push the button on the phone, hello, and you know what's gonna happen, it's not gonna be good news. Those toxic relationships are the things that can bring you down. And relationships are so critical because the ones that you build now, if you look around at the people in here right now, these are some of the people that are going to be some of the best friends that you have, or worst, for the rest of your life. These are the connections that you're making right now that can take you to the next level and carry you over. So it's going to be critical that you find time to actually sit back and have time for laughter and really involve yourself and thoroughly immerse yourself in things that are positive and things that build you up. Dr. Cousins, Dr. Norman Cousins, he was given six months to live. He was a nutritionist and he had an infection in his spine. And through nutrition and laughter, he went in after that first um, exam when they told him he had six months to live and he stopped taking his meds. And they said, Jay, you're doing great. They thought it was the medication. He locked himself in his room away from everybody. Sometimes when you're out there, and right now, every single one of you are a first generation. So what you're doing is you're locking yourself away from something that you, that, that, that you know nothing about. You're taking yourself to a whole level that, 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 that you don't even see. But once you grasp the vision and you have it, sometimes you got to lock yourself away. And you got to be by yourself. He locked himself away, he put himself in rooms, his favorite comedies, and he sat and he just listened and he laughed and he laughed and he laughed. In a six month period, he healed himself from that infection. They made him a, um, a professor at the school and he got a prize, I mean, and he, and he totally changed his lives and the lives of others. And this is just through laughing. Laughing. Now this is with people, not at them, but laughing. This is the exciting concept of when you can take something so small and make a force. People is the next aspect. This is the third P. Now this one is probably one of the biggest ones. Your ability to communicate and talk to people and really relate to people, and this is everyone. Every single person that you're talking to right now is an asset to you. Every single person that you know has something that they can give, that they can build. Yesterday I was walking around downtown Dallas and um, a guy asked me for some, some change, some money. And, um, and I, I didn't have any change. I went into the store, I got, I got a dollar and then I sat next to him and I said, uh, well before I give you this dollar, I want you to tell me why you're sitting out here. I said, you look healthy. I said, you look healthier than me. You look younger than me as a matter of fact. I said, why are you sitting out here on this stool? And he began to tell me 
all of the things that were going on in his life. And he began to tell me how he came from, um, um, coincidentally, Chicago. And he got into some, some credit problems. Or so, and I just began to hear him talk, go down a rabbit hole of these excuses that he had for himself. And I told him. And he said, nobody has ever told me that before. No one has ever listened to me before. I didn't have anything else to do, so I sat there and listened. But you don't know who you're touching and who you're inspiring. And the thing about that is we're all bridge builders. And if you build a bridge for somebody else, you better believe when you turn around, they're going to be lifting you up when you need it. Always thinking win win when you're in a situation. And now that I'm married, when you're in a marriage, it has to be a win win situation for everybody. If you need something from someone, if you're going to ask something from someone, if you have a desire from something from someone, how can they win and you get me? How can they have value? And, and you and you being lifted up. What is it that, that they can have? What's their winning point? The minute that you think like that, the minute that that, that becomes a, a, a permanent imprint, you begin to have a heart of a servant. Communication is going to be your biggest tool. Communication is going to be one of your best friends. If you don't think that you're a good communicator, one of the best things you can do is just start talking to people. Just start talking to people. Talk to them. You might offend some people. You'll learn what to say and what not to say. I have multitude of, of people that I know that have the most education. They're some of the smartest people that I know, but they have no ability to communicate. No ability to communicate. One of the mayors, mayoral um, candidates in Chicago this year, uh, he started off as a, a sharecropper. He was ran out of Mississippi to Chicago. All he had was uh, a bag with some food in it and the clothes on his back. He came to Chicago. He came to Chicago and he started working in McDonald's. He didn't start managing them. Then he bought some. He had 15 McDonald's. Then he sold them. He now owns an international company that, distri that distributes um, plastic silverware and, and the, the, the napkins that you use all around the entire world. He's a multi-millionaire. But he can barely talk straight. He ran for mayor and nobody wanted to listen to anything that he says because of his inability to communicate. Right now, some of the best things that you can do, if you learned anything about the Obama administration and, and how he got elected, was his ability to touch something in people that wasn't being touched through communication. And this is... This is how you communicate with your children, your loved ones, and the people around you. And the biggest thing that you really got to understand is when you're communicating with people, all right, be very interested and not interesting. Being very interested and not interesting is going to be something that's going to change your life. And trust me, once you start doing it, it's actually a whole lot of fun because I, I, I can talk about myself all the time. You know, it actually gets kind of boring hearing about myself. But when you can meet someone and know what their goals are, what their why is, what their purpose is, imagine someone has a similar why to what you want to accomplish or what you want to do and how you could be a part of that. You might be the missing piece to something so much bigger and greater that's out there for you. And it's not just for you, it's for your family. It's for your future and more so importantly, for community. I never used to like to speak. Hated it. When I became a chiropractor, I graduated from, um, well, I got out the Army. And I, um, I went to chiropractic school, and a dear friend of mine, we were going to be roommates. 
We were sharing a room. I was so excited. I got to chiropractic school and he called me and told me that he wasn't coming. So that meant that I didn't have money for an apartment. I was homeless for three weeks. I lived in a parking lot of my chiropractic school. I used to get chased by the, the security guards. I had to keep moving my car. I had shifts that I would sleep in, so when they came to check my car, I wasn't in there. Finally, I started to have to sleep in the lobby. I fell asleep by the library one day on the couch and I didn't get up. And they told me I couldn't sleep on the campus anymore. They sat me in the principal's office and they asked me what was my problem and I, I told them I didn't have a place to live. I don't know if this was a blessing or everything is a blessing, but I ended up moving in with the vice president of the college. I was living with the vice president of the college. So you, I had a curfew. I was asked about my grades and how things were going. I slept in his son's room. His wife did my laundry. I found a way real fast to get a roommate. But when you want it so bad that you're willing to do anything to have it, I mean anything to have it, it's going to happen. And all of a sudden, the universe is going to open up and put things right in front of your place. And this is why it's so powerful, it's so powerful to have a desire. If you don't think something can happen, just show up. Just show up and visualize what you want to happen. Just try it. Go into a restaurant, order some food, and no, don't do that. But, I, but when you want something and you got a desire, and you want it, and you want it so bad that you can taste it, it begins to happen. And the next thing, as far as really with people, is service. And I want to share something. trying to say is, is being a servant to the people, being a servant to every single person around you. If you don't, that, that was Martin Luther King from his uh, speech, the drum major. And if you haven't heard that speech, uh, a good friend of mine actually referred me to, to watch that and I, and I got that out of that and it, it really touched my heart. People is being people oriented and the thing about your attitude some people, they say, well, Doc, you know, I, I don't have the best attitude all the time. One of the best things that you could do is fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. If you got a frown on your face, walk around smiling until it hurts. All of a sudden, it will become a habit. If you're not in a good mood, 
act in a good mood till you get on people's nerves. Fake it till you make it, and you'd be surprised what blossoms out of that. Don't forget habits are the things that come from the things that you do constantly. Staying honest is something that's going to be powerful as well. The thing about honesty is it keeps you above reproach. And you know it's hard to lie. You know how hard it is to lie because you got to keep remembering that stuff, right? Being honest is the thing that's going to keep you moving forward. If anything, honesty is the thing that's going to help you to have a, a stronger foundation of who you are when people are talking to you. You, The people that you go talk to when you're at your lowest are the people that give it to you straight. No matter what it is, no matter what the situation is, or no matter how harsh it sounds, you want to hear the truth. And this is how you're going to build the relationships with people. One of the things about these trees, so these are the redwood trees. These are trees that have been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Is it because of the deep roots? Do you know that these trees only have roots between six to eight feet deep? How do they stay up? And how have they been up for thousands of years? These are massive trees. Some of these trees are the width of this entire stage and bigger, but they're only six feet deep in the ground. How these trees actually stay up is, is all of the root systems on the bottom of these trees are intertwined. They're interconnected. They're a community. They're a team. And by them being interconnected and rooted together, what they do is they build a foundation and a legacy of life. These are the roots that you're putting in your system today. These are the things, and if you can learn from the redwood tree, if you learn anything from it, learning how teamwork and people and the people around you and how you serve them is going to be something that's going to be foundational for you to have success in the future. And last, the last P is passion. How many of us need more passion? Raise your hand if you need more passion. It's okay. So let's look at the definition of passion right now. Strong and barely controllable emotion. Suffering. So who wants passion now? Some people, you guys, I'll tell you what. So you're talking about suffering. And see, this is what people believe. They believe that you can get to success. And it's not going to be a breakdown. They believe that you can have things and it's not going to be an upset. See, uh, the thing about every breakdown is a breakthrough. you got to embrace every single breakdown that you have. Because it's another learning opportunity to excel you. Some of the people that have got the first... Donald Trump has went bankrupt how many times? Some of the most successful people on the planet are the ones that have made mistake after mistake after mistake. So first time college students, get ready to make some mistakes because it's not by chance that you're here. And mistakes are the things that are going to make you resilient. Mistakes are the reason why I'm up here on the stage today, because I can talk about every single one I have. And how I'm right there related with you. If anything, I've made more than you. That's why I'm up here. It's every single thing that you do. So now I'm a chiropractor and I have four businesses. And now I'm starting another business where I actually coach doctors all around the country and how to have successful practice and transforming their communities. An initiative is going into the school systems and helping people to have healthier communities in the school. This is something coming out of starting off when I graduated chiropractic school, I was walking down the street and I didn't have anything but my car and I was living in a hotel room. I didn't have any money and I walked to the landlord and I said, look, I want to put a chiropractic office here. He said, okay. He said, um, do you have any money? I said, no. He said, okay. He said, do you have any patients? I said, yes. He said, where are they? I said, they're everywhere. Look outside. There's patients everywhere. I sat there with him for two hours, and I told him my vision of what I had planned for that building. He not only gave me the rent free for three months, he did the build out for me, and he allowed me to use his place to use the phone, 
to use paper to make faxes because I didn't have anything. A year later, I bought my first home. And I was able to finance my second practice the second year. And this is coming from nothing. And you all are all coming from the same place I'm coming from. Passion. How bad do you want it? Expect a little pain. Expect a little discomfort. Expect a little growth pain. It's going to come, but every breakdown is a breakthrough. And lastly, this right here, I have for you, this is the Chinese bamboo. And when you're talking about passion, you can pass those up. When you're talking about passion, there's this, this little, that little seed right there is called a Chinese bamboo. Anybody familiar with the Chinese bamboo plant? Anybody? It's an amazing plant. The thing about this plant is, is this. You put this seed in the ground, and you have to water and fertilize it on a ritualistic schedule every single day for five years, and it doesn't grow. You have to water this plant. So your friends are coming by, and they're looking at you, and they're like, so you got something in the ground here, huh? Year number one. Year number two, you're outside, you're, you're, you're fertilizing, you're working the soil, you're sweating. And your friends are telling you, you know that you're wasting your time. Year number four, year number five comes, and then they begin to say, you know what, you're crazy. You're crazy. You're sitting up, you're digging in this dirt, you're standing there, you're sprinkling all this goat fertilizer on the ground, and nothing's coming up. But the thing about the bamboo plant is, in that fifth year, I believe it's in five weeks it'll grow up to 90 feet. 90 feet. It's almost as if it grows right in front of your eyes. One of the things I want to tell you all, <clears throat> right now you are that bamboo seed. You're in the ground, you're fertilizing, you're digging, you're pushing, you're watering. Keep fertilizing. Keep digging. Keep giving. These are the critical thinking skills that you can that can utilize you can utilize to take you to a whole nother level in your life. It's the small things, the details that make the difference. If you miss one day, one day fertilizing that plant, it's not gonna sprout. It's not gonna grow. Keep fertilizing. I want to thank you all for your time. I want to thank you all for having me come here and speak. And I just wish blessings on you in, in, in every single thing you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vaughn, for that powerful presentation. Uh, let's give another round of applause, guys. And we've got a few minutes for a couple of question, question and answers, and then we'll move on to the next part of our presentation. So, so if you've got some questions, uh, raise your hand, I'm going to get the mic and I'll kind of walk around. Oh, and the, the thing that I passed out, the flyer, is something that I have up on my mirror every day. I kind of write my name on it. And I remind myself every single day to keep fertilizing and keep watering the plant. So it's a little reminder for something from me to you. I hope it could be of something of value to you. Hello. Right here. Right here. Okay. How you doing? Uh, all right. Uh, what college did you attend? Which one, undergrad or? or when, you still, when you stand with the dean. Oh, Logan College of Chiropractic. Oh, okay. I guess my question would be, how did you continue pushing and not give up when you was sleeping in your car? That that's a that's a great question. I um when I was when I was sitting in that car and I um I looked at 
it was the vision that I had in my head. It was where I saw myself being at, and I knew that if I would have got out of that car, I wouldn't have arrived at the destination. I had a clear vision of what I needed to do, and I felt that no matter where I was at, whether it was sleeping in my car, whether it was living on a, a bench, whether it was inside a, a building or a friend, anywhere that as long as I was in school and I was giving it everything I got, I was going to get to that destination. I said, if, if I get a degree, I, I, I can be a doctor. If I finish this course, I'm going to be a doctor and I'm going to have different circumstances. So I, I, I focused on that. I focused on that, that, that clear vision, on, on the outcome. That's a good question. You know, that's an excellent question, and um, I was, I just got out the military. So, um, of course, you go into the military and you spend every penny that you have out there because you're young and you and you, um, you just be happy to be able to buy things. So, as soon as I got out, two weeks later, chiropractic school started. My family wasn't the, the educated, isn't the educated type. Um, they really didn't even know where I was at. Um, my mother really, you know, with the multiple sclerosis, I didn't want to tell her anything because when she would get stressed, you know, get seizures and, and all kind of things would happen. So I just, I, I would get a lot of discouragement when I asked people stuff. They'd be like, just come on home, you know, you can wait, you can you can do this. It was, it, it was honestly, it was my mother. Uh, growing up in a, a single parent home and watching her from the bed raise us, and some of the things that she would tell us would be about faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, walking by faith and not by sight. I never believed that I needed to have anything tangible in order for something to happen. I believed that it would happen. As long as I was really clear on doing something, that I was going to make sure I was supporting others. So I knew that being a doctor, I'd be able to help a lot of people. And I didn't think anything would happen or stand in my way as long as my heart was pure and my thoughts were pure and I had faith that I would have that. And that's what I've been taught my entire life. And, 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 it, it, just, and it just materialized. Does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, so earlier you, uh, you mentioned the importance of finding your why. So what I want to ask you is, what's your why in the career path that you chose? You said, what's my why with what now? The why, you know, the the most, like, the reason why you chose the career path in the first place. What's that passion that keeps you driving forward? You know, I, um, my mother was, you know, diagnosed with the multiple sclerosis. And, and in my community, uh, you know, we didn't have insurance. Um, and a lot of people in my community didn't have insurance. So oftentimes, uh, I wanted to be a heart surgeon initially. Because I believed, I wanted to do something where... I could uh, save lives, like, I mean, just really save lives. And growing up in, uh, in the hospital systems uh, my entire life, always going to the hospital, one thing I watched is what, the, uh, is what the doctors did. And they seemed to have very little care for the patients, and they offered very little help. Um, what I saw was surgeries and, and uh, bills coming to the house and medication, constant medication, and I didn't see health being talked about or being administered until I ran into what chiropractic was. And when I learned that chiropractic actually supported people's bodies and supporting themselves for their entire life without drugs and surgery, that was the missing key for me. That was the key to the riddle. That was the answer. I could help people and not have to prescribe them a prison cell inside of a pill bottle. And I wish I could have given it to her earlier, but. I can give it to many, many people now. Good question. 